Bread is an invention, like a chair, a car, a shoe, or a necklace. Like inventions, other inventions, it, it doesn't, it's not an agricultural crop. No farmer ever picked a bread from a tree. No farmer ever dug one up from the ground or, or harvested um, a row of grasses or vines to, to get breads off of them. Like, like a chair, car, shoe, necklace, um, bread is made of, 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 of components that themselves are manufactured. So, you know, flour is not, you know, is, is not a raw um, head of, of, of barley or, or wheat or rye or, or millet. It's, it's processed. And in that processing, in the way in which the baker goes about the bread, there's always a bread dream. Um, and it, it could be for a giant corporation, like how can I get the cheapest bread out of here that, that is palatable? How can I make the most money? I mean, this is, this is also a vision. Um, but but um, everything that a baker does with bread um, has cultural meaning. Uh, whether it's a big loaf, a small loaf, a fine crumb, a, um, a very big open crumb. And the bread that we're going to discuss today, that Jenny's going to introduce us today, and that, that Susan and others are going to talk about, is a bread actually that does not have an open crumb. It's very different from our modern dream. Which brings us to the night sky and the my, my ritual second slide. So I want you to imagine that this is the stars at night. And if you don't live in Istanbul or Ankara or New York or Los Angeles, and um, you can actually see a proper sky with, with stars, ideally even with the Milky Way. There's lots of patterns there. And culturally, we all have names for some of those patterns in the Western world. We have the, or the, 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 the world, the, the culture based on Greece, Greek and Rome, Greece and Rome, you know, we have these Cassiopeia and these Roman and, and these Greek gods that are up in the sky. And the one thing that we don't have up in the sky, though, is the recipe for the best bread. And I think I know all of you in the, in the who have an interest in bread, you know that there's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of certainty in some of the bread world about what makes a good, not just a good bread, but the best bread and what's a good bread and a bad bread. And what's wonderful about today's talk by Jenny right. and, and, and with her colleague, um, acknowledging her colleague, uh, Susan, is that they both had a dream in their heart. And we've heard that Susan got her dream from her grandmother and her name um, for a bread that is just radically different, radically different than anything else. And with that, I'd like to turn the talk over to Jenny. Well, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for coming. It's a pleasure to share all this information and knowledge with you. Um, uh, if everyone can see, uh, now I think some of you have seen a recipe. There was a recipe that was sent out. And if you remember looking at it, it had three stages. And I have prepared some starters. I wish you could smell them. Because as Eileen said, and as I'm sure any of these uh, fermented breads with bacteria, with wild bacteria will say, it stinks. Uh, <laughs> and here I, I have a potato starter. I don't know if you all can see the bubbles, the fermentation going on. There's a fair bit of foam on top. And this was started about 10 hours ago. And it's looking good and I can smell it. So I always look for the foam and I look for the smell. And it's pretty strong, but not quite as strong, I don't think, as it could be. Uh, now the second stage of the bread, and these are kind of uh, time-honored stages, I'll be talking about them, is called the sponge. And I, I just took an, a second starter, I removed the potatoes, and I added flour. So now I have kind of a thick pancake batter in here, and I'm keeping it warm. 
That's one of the secrets with salt rising bread. It has to be kept warm. And, and, and I want you to notice that at this point, it's about this far up. And we're going to be watching it here in the next half hour. Hopefully, it's going to rise all the way to the top. And there's no yeast, of course, no commercial yeast. There's no wild sourdough yeast. This is using the wild bacteria that's on the potatoes and the uh, cornmeal and garbanzo flour, which I always add. It's another uh, ingredient that I've uh, found out about through our research on salt rising bread. So I'm gonna put this back in my water bath, which I've established here. If, uh, if everybody can see, I have a sous vide. And uh, it's a, a, a big thermometer that allows the water bath to be kept at a constant temperature. And uh, that's very important for salt rising bread. Uh, I also want to welcome anyone to have any questions throughout to just speak up and, um, you know, say, hey, I've got a question. I don't mind interruptions at all. I, I actually welcome them. I think it what, makes what, it much more interesting. What, Jenny, what temperature is the machine Yeah, center? yeah. Of, of course, it has to be a very specific temperature. I like mine about 40 degrees C. So this is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, the range is uh, maybe about maybe four, maybe 39 degrees C to about 43 degrees C. Imagine the I'm sorry. Did you want me to say in Fahrenheit about 103 degrees Fahrenheit to about 108? That's my preferred temperature. And, and I find if you control the temperature, you have much more success. Oh, it's not a... Have you used a crock pot before? Yeah, I have used a crock pot, but it's a little too hot. Okay. Now there is something called the instant pot, which I okay. have not, I've not used the instant pot yet, but if you put it at the yeast, no, the yogurt setting, it, it, and people swear by it. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking of either a crock pot because I don't have an Instapot or a heating pad, but I don't think the heating pad is going to get it quite hot enough. It probably will. Oh, yes, okay. a heating pad can work very well, except sometimes they shut off after an hour and a half and yep. you need about a eight to 10 hour consistent temperature. Feel a water bath from like the the chemistry lab. <laughs> exactly. Oh, exactly. Yes. At when I had the Rising Creek Bakery, that's what we used. It worked beautifully. Thank you. Could I say something? Yes, uh, please, Mary. Referring to that. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, um, uh, uh, just a, a clarification regarding our cadena bread. It our cadena bread is. Uh, made using the, the 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 sourdough, let's say, is made using the foam, uh, which is the result, the froth, which is the result of soaking a cadena with um, uh, water and spices. And then this um, this froth together with flour is made um, is is used as a sourdough, not the water, only the froth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find that very interesting. And yeah. I'd love to know more about that. Yes. And well, and also another thing that, that relates to what you have just said, the eight to 10 hours, um, the amount of time required to collect the necessary froth, mix it with flour and let it become sourdough. It was 12 hours at least. Wow. It, was, it was more, yeah, uh, back in the old days. And that's why it, this um, sourdough was named Arcadis, which is the word Ergadis, which is laborer in the Cyprus dialect, uh, because at, back then uh, a laborer would work for so long during the day. <laughs> so oh. this is how this is how the name Arcadena. Uh, uh, this is from where it came from. It's like a work shift, the length of a work shift. Uh, 
Yeah, well, the, the, the name is actually the, not, the, not, not the sheep, the laborer. Ergaris. The laborer. Ah, oh, the name of the laborer. All right. The, the, the laborer, the... not the work sheep. The, the, okay. the actual the, 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 man, the person. Woman. Okay. Yeah. And, but and, yeah. And you mentioned spices. What kind of spices are you? Uh, okay, they were using um um okay the water was boiled first with uh, with the ginger with cinnamon and um, th th this kind of, of of spices sweet in inverted commas uh, spices uh, it, that was not very um the, this aroma was not very strong but it it, it it was used as a starter and that one together uh, with the a uh, very distinctive aroma. Uh, it, it was an aroma. It was not a stink <laughs> smell of the froth of um, of, of chickpeas. Uh, gave um, a catena bread this very particular flavor. Um, I've seen in some books, um, international books in English, uh, recipes for a catena using gram flour. So instead of soaking cheese chickpeas, they are using chickpea flour. This is, it has nothing to do with that cadena. This is something uh, completely different. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much for, for, for letting me sharing it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's also a warning to everybody. You, you, cannot, you cannot work in, in most of these recipes in English. So, you know, you work out how to find, if you know you want to be working in Greek, then use Google Translate and and, and get, to, get to sources in the original languages because everything gets simplified. Sorry for taking your time, Jenny. No problem. Um, I think what I'll do right now is just start sharing the screen. I have a PowerPoint that I'll share with everybody. And I th it works better for me to just keep it in this format. I hope everybody can see it fine. We're good. Okay. So I want to uh, begin uh, the, my talk with Soul Rising Bread that Susan Brown and myself have spent decades studying this bread that's uh, got a very unique flavor and a unique fermentation. And uh, here is uh, some contact information. Oops, there we go. For Susan and myself, Susan has a wonderful website. It's called uh, saltrisingbread.net. And she loves hearing from people and loves hearing their stories. And, and there's some wonderful recipes and stories on there that uh, Susan is glad to share. Um, we've put together a wonderful YouTube that's free to the public. If you search for on YouTube, Salt Rising Bread, then you can see our video here that tells all about it. And uh, my email, I'm also glad to hear from anybody if you have any questions. Uh, I'll show this slide at the end as well so you can get that contact info. So uh, what we have found out is that this uh, heritage of making salt rising bread came from the Appalachians. It's a region in the United States. You can see it's this range of mountains where the early pioneer women lived in the 1700s. They were isolated from each other from large urban centers. And they uh, came up with this method of salt rising bread. And, I, and I'm going to be telling you about the history of salt rising bread. Here is uh, Susan's grandmother, Catherine oh. Irwin. And uh, Susan's legacy then is the West Virginia culture. She was brought up in West Virginia and uh, learned how to make salt rising bread from her grandmother. Whereas uh, myself, I'm a New Englander. So I don't, I wasn't aware and wasn't knowledgeable about the West Virginia culture, but I have learned it since. And I learned how to make salt rising bread from this wonderful woman, Pearl Haynes. She's since passed away. She made salt rising bread for almost a hundred years. And this is the bowl that Pearl would make salt rising bread in. Her great grandfather in 1860 carved this bowl and gave it to his daughter who was Pearl's grandmother. 
And then this bowl was passed down and through the family. So salt rising bread was passed down through Pearl's family in an oral tradition. Uh, there was very little that was written down, but uh, these people had wonderful traditions that they followed and uh, they had a, a wonderful pride, which is what you find in West Virginia people as well. Very kind, but proud of their traditions. And uh, I also like to point out in the beginning how salt rising bread, because it's fermented by wild bacteria, differs from the sourdough breads. So we have this heat here. This is a very important variable that you have, you must follow with salt rising bread. Whereas sourdough, it likes the cooler temperatures. They call it at room temperature. Uh, salt rising bread starter takes about eight to 12 hours. And, but the salt, wild sourdough, if you don't add any commercial yeast, also will take a, a good amount of time to develop the wonderful flavor. With salt rising bread, you have to start fresh every time. Whereas with sourdough, you can keep that sourdough starter for hundreds of years. And, and the chemical uh, uh, formulation that is occurring in the bread is slightly different with salt rising bread as with the Arcatena and the Eftazimo and the Nohutlu. Mayali bread in Turkey, you're converting starch to sugar. You're giving off a fair amount of hydrogen gas as well as CO2. Whereas with sourdough, you're uh, converting the sugars to alcohol. And as Eileen mentioned, the breads look very different. Here you see the salt rising. You would recognize this also in the Arcatena and the Eftazimo. It's a very tight grain. Uh, bread with a flat top, whereas with sourdough, you see those large holes and the rounded top. So uh, through Susan and my research over the decades, at first we thought, okay, maybe salt rising bread came from the Irish, the Scots, the, the people who had emigrated to early America. And we have researched breads in those countries. We've talked to bakers. We've looked at the cookbooks. As far as we can tell, there is no bread that is raised by wild bacteria from any of these European countries. Now, at the time, we had not investigated the breads of Greece or Cyprus. But the same for Germany. People would say, oh, the German bakers brought it. But we have researched breads in Germany. We've looked at the cookbooks. There is no history in Germany, Italy, France of a bacteria leavened bread. So then our next, next quest took us to the slave food historians. Okay, maybe the slaves brought this knowledge with them. We've talked with many slave food historians. We've read the slave food ways. And again, no evidence of this tradition of a bacteria leavened bread. So it brought us to the conclusion that it was the Appalachian women who came up with this method. And uh, it's, they were ingenious. And this is in the 1700s when the salt rising bread recipes begin to appear. And uh, Susan and I believe that these women were uh, very knowledgeable about their fires. They were intuitive in the baking process and they, excuse me, and they discovered natural leaveners on their own uh, without uh, reading cookbooks, without talking with other knowledgeable sourdough great uh, bakers. And, and you have to imagine that they were uh, really working on the survival of their families. They wanted to persevere with quality food to feed their family. Jenny? Yes? How did you, in, in among all this, I'm sure you have looked at the American Indian tradition, but is there yes. anything in there that would give you a... Yes, good question. Yes. As far as I can tell, the Native Americans did use potash, which is what I'm gonna be talking about next. 
but they didn't put it in their baked goods to leaven. They used potash, of course, to uh, break open the outside layer of corn to allow it to be more nutritious. It's called a nixtamalization. Uh, but as far as I can tell, I've never read where the Native Americans used potash to raise their biscuits. So, so what is this potash? You basically take the ashes from your fire, you add water, you let the ashes settle, and you come up with this solution that's alkaline, very similar to what we make today, baking soda. But back 300 years ago, uh, this is what it was called, potash. And I want to point out Linda Civitello's book. She has a wonderful book, Baking Powder Wars, where she talks about this. And, and it's the same thing that I came up with. I concluded by looking at the cookbooks in early America versus the cookbooks in Europe. And it <laughs> seems like this knowledge that the uh, early American pioneers had to use potash inside their baked goods was then shared over to Europe. Of course, potash had been used for thousands of years already. Glass making all across Europe and Egypt and uh, the Middle East. In the 600 to 1100th century, people brushed a potash solution on top of their pretzels to make them brown. But it seems like it was the early American pioneer women who used it inside their baked goods. And, and this is one of the theories we have as to how salt rising bread got its name, because a salt was added to the starter. Potash is a type of chemist salt. At the time, they didn't, uh, it, it, at the time it was called potash. And then uh, this knowledge, as I said, the American pioneer women shared this knowledge over to Europe. And then by the mid 1800s, the Europeans made their own potash. They couldn't keep importing all this wood from the States for potash. They couldn't cut down any more trees in Europe. So they started manufacturing it. Then that knowledge was shared back across the Atlantic to America. And the Americans started making their own potash, manufacturing it. Here in the States, it was known as saleratus in the eight, late 1850s up to the 1900s, you would see saleratus being used in the baked goods and in salt rising bread. Uh, a, a funny story, Susan and I were interviewing Pearl Haynes uh, pretty close to when she passed away. And we asked Pearl, I think Susan asked her, Pearl, did you ever hear of saleratus? And Pearl, who's like 96 at the time said, saltaritis, saltaritis. My grandmother put saltaritis in her salt rising bread and we were just blown away. It gave us chills to hear this. So saltaritis was Pearl's way of saying saleratus. Well, it sounded, saltaritis sounds like salt rising, but who knows? And, um, and of course now we all know this product as baking soda, sodium bicarbonate. Um, the second theory about salt rising bread that we've, uh, Susan and I have come up with is that the people would heat salt and surround their starter with warm salt. You can do it with blocks of rock salt or like the Mormons, we came across a wonderful diary that the Mormons have written. And by the way, the, the Mormons keep very good records. So they're a, a valuable source, a viable source of anything in the 1800s in early America. So this diary entry talked about uh, a salt barrel that was here on the outside of the wagon train. And they would position it so that the sun would beat down on this salt barrel. The women put their starter inside that salt barrel where it got heated by the sun. At the end of the day, when the uh, wagon trains were put around the fire, then the women would make their salt rising bread after it fermented all day. 
these Mormon women also uh, would take a white powder from the ground and how they figured out that this was a similar compound, I don't know, but they would put this uh, white powder from the ground, they called it saleratus, into their salt rising bread. And it would help in the rising. This is something that is not well understood by myself or I don't think anybody here in the States as to why this alkaline chemical seems to benefit salt rising bread. Okay, so about this time, uh, Walter Stubbs was running for governor of Kansas to state in one of the states in the Midwest of the United States. So this is 1909, about 100 years ago. And he swore by eating salt rising bread. And he said, by, it gives, gives you strength and endurance. And it's a revolution in bread making because there is no yeast. But at the same time, there were many failures with salt rising bread that you can read in the newspapers at the time. So uh, Walter Stubbs did become governor and he went on uh, to donate some money to this Dr. Komen. And uh, he, here's the first scientist in the United States to study salt rising bread. This is about a hundred years ago. He analyzed the starters, he looked at them microscopically, and he found that it was a bacteria, not a yeast. So uh, Komen, about 100 years ago, was the first person here in the States to study salt rising bread, and there has been very little research conducted ever since on salt rising bread. Uh, Komen went on to produce a salt rising yeast. He called it a yeast and he sold it for decades across the United States. Commercial bakeries would make their salt rising bread using this, this uh, patent that Dr. Komen had formulated. And even King Arthur Flower uh, in the early, later 1900s used his concoction. So it was about this time that Susan and I are thinking, okay, this bacteria that Komen had isolated 100 years ago, today it's known as clostridium. And if, if, if anyone knows food pathogens, as soon as you hear clostridium, of course, there's a big red flag. It's like, what? You're, 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 you're fermenting clostridium perfingens in your bread? Mm -hmm. So Susan and I were a little worried because here we are feeding our children, our husbands of this bread all the time. And um, so we contacted a, uh, a pathologist and it was lucky for us, he happened to be quite close up at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Bruce McLean. He's a world renowned pathologist on Clostridium perfingens. And we asked him if he would please uh, entertain us with analyzing our bread starters and our bread because nobody is getting sick. We, there is no history of anybody getting sick eating this bread. And he said, yes, please come up. So we, Susan and I loaded up our car with a dozen starters. We went up to his laboratory with starters and bread and we walk in and it smells just like salt rising bread. So, he, uh, he, his uh, uh, lab assistants, uh, postdocs and scientists, they all analyzed the starters and the bread and they did a, a very complicated genetic analysis. They did not find any toxins. They didn't even find the genes. The DNA that produced the toxins was not present in any of our starters. So we felt very relieved by this and uh, went on to help uh, Dr. Juckett publish an article to document that there is no disease with anybody who eats salt rising bread. And, and these are the scientific reasons. So here, here is like one of the next scientific studies of salt rising bread. And this was in 2008. So up till now, still nobody has studied salt rising bread. At the same time, there's a lot of literature now coming out that shows that clostridium 
is indeed a part of our healthy gut. We all have this clostridium perfringens in our stomachs. It promotes anti-inflammatory responses. It's helping our immune systems. So all of this was really valuable knowledge for us to know and to promote. At the same time, Susan and I also found these articles about Eftazimo in Greece, uh, where they studied the genetics of the Eftazimo bread leavened by chickpeas, and they found the same uh, bacteria and the same uh, kind of results that there is no toxins present, there is no gene for these toxins, but it's very similar to salt rising bread. There was a, a, another study by uh, some people in Sudan who studied gurgoosh, which is a, a similar bread fermented with lentils and milk. And um, this was all very fascinating for us to learn about. Uh, but still, there hadn't been any studies in the United States about salt rising bread. Uh, so what we have concluded is that this wild fermentation using bacteria, it's, it's really a time-honored uh, method uh, that's been used hundreds, thousands of years. I think the Turkish, the Nohutlu Mayeli bread, and Eileen, you can correct me, I think it's thousands of years old. And it, the same may be for the Architena and the Eftazimo. I just don't know. I haven't been able to study the history. And, and they still seem to use this three-step method. So it's very interesting. These breads uh, maybe were spontaneously discovered in different parts of the world, but they're all very similar. And, and here is the recipe that I think you all have access to. I condensed it a little bit. It's showing those three stages. Now, I do want to show you, I'm going to stop sharing the screen here for a little bit. Uh, here is this sponge, and, and you can see it's starting to rise up. It's, a, it's a, maybe about two thirds full now. I'll, hopefully it rises up in the next 15 minutes. Okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen. Does anybody have any questions? Is there any like hallmark signs when you know your starter is ready to go? Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Aurelia, yeah. I always look for the foam and I look for the smell. Those are the two indicators. And um, I, I wish you all could smell this because it's, it's very evident here in my kitchen. I've heard it's the cheesy or yeah. very... Stinky no. feet, um, dirty sneakers. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I have to uh, reiterate, as Marilena has done, that as the process goes on, the smell becomes wonderful. And by the time you pull the bread out of the oven, it's a, a, a fabulous, sweet, cheesy smell that uh, people remember for centuries. Jenny? Yeah, Susan. I just want to point out that um, garbanzo flour is not traditionally used in the salt rising bread recipes. And Jenny has been fortunate enough and smart enough to find out that it works wonderful, wonderfully in the recipe. But if you go back to the original salt rising bread recipes, they did not use garbanzo flour, just wheat flour. And potatoes and cornmeal. So traditionally, yeah, that the chickpea uh, uh, addition is something that I came up at the bakery because we had so many failures. And as soon as I started adding the chickpeas, the consistency and the failures just, it was not an issue anymore. I'm, I'm curious about the Clostridium perfringens that it is a causative agent of many, many foodborne illnesses in the United States. I think the CDC puts it at about a million a, a year and it does produce a toxin. So I'm curious why 
you know, your testing showed no toxin. Well, it's a good question, and I have not been able to get an answer from any scientist, including Bruce McLean. He, he cannot definitively answer that question. I think that bacteria are not fully understood, that the species of bacteria is, is constantly being reevaluated. And um, if, you, if you look at bacillus, there, there's a bacillus anthracnose that causes anthrax, and, and people die from this all the time. Yet there are many bacillus species that do not produce that toxin. Um, uh, scientifically, uh, the, oftentimes in bacteria, the toxins reside on plasmids. I don't know if you, you know, the plasmid is a separate circular DNA that is separate from the nucleus, which tends to be larger in the DNA. So the toxins seem to reside on this smaller circular DNA and why they disappear in the salt rising bread, in the, in, in the heftasimo, in the gurgoosh from Sudan. Yeah, good question. Okay, I'm also curious that someplace I read that perfringens is a causative agent of uh, gangrene, and that there yeah. was an article that said that they, there were occasions of people getting the bacteria for the bread from wound bandages. Well, it, it's funny you bring that up. This was an, uh, a research project that was conducted in the 1920s. So we're talking 100 years ago, okay? They, they didn't understand DNA back then. They didn't even know DNA existed back then. And the scientist that did that study, 1920s, um, he, this only occurred once, as far as I know. Uh, I know that uh, Harry McGee kind of had a lot of fun with his popular science article about this. But uh, the guy who did that 100 years ago apparently did make a bread from the bacteria that he got from a wound. And then he fed the bread to a guinea pig and the guinea pig died. I, I don't know, it's, it's uh, sensationalist to say the least. I had only seen it once and didn't know where I had yeah. read it. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, the, the toxin portion of Clostridium perfringens it might be, it's a spore forming bacteria. So you yes. might not have conditions that are susceptible to that in your process. Also very important, you have a kill step in the baking of the bread too. So that's another safeguard. Exactly. Um, at least that's what we do in industrial. Like we love our kill step of baking products. So we don't have to worry about as much. So in the industrial world of baking. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. You know, I had, I had a more practical question for you. Uh -huh. um, <clears throat> I've been making this bread for, for years and years and years now. Oh, wonderful, uh, Ken. Something that my grandmother used to make huh? with chickpeas, right? Um, and, and where was your grandmother from, please? Uh, she was from actually uh, from Northern Italy. Uh, and on uh, some, uh, she grew up on some kind of a farming commune way, way up in the, the mountains. And they just would use uh, chickpeas to create this um, fabulous bread. And it's really fascinating, actually. Uh, but yeah. uh, the question I had, because I've never tried this before, is uh, on a practical level, do you think that using um, uh, unpasteurized milk I've tried it. Uh, would have any uh, effect? And also, do you think that uh, for the home audience, so to speak, uh, that doesn't have access to, like, say, raw milk, do you think using condensed milk or powdered milk uh, would affect the eventual outcome? Well, I know uh, many people have used powdered milk, mm. and I've never tried condensed milk. I have tried raw milk, and I had success. Mm -hmm. but it didn't seem to uh, lend <clears throat> any advantage to the final flavor. Okay, and did you actually, did you boil 
the milk? Did you pasteurize it? Uh, no, I think I just heated it to about 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Let's see, what, what is that Celsius? Um, I kind of forget what that is Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Because most of the recipes that I've seen for this, a friend of mine actually just published a recipe a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, Kirsten Shockey published a, 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 a book called Miso Tempe Natto, because obviously uh, natto can be, uh, or back, uh, Bacillus subtilis can actually be used to make a salt rising bread, really? uh, which they've been using, or you know, a, a bread that rises uh, using bacteria. And wow. they've been doing that in Japan for quite some time now. No kidding. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that, Ken. This is fabulous. Yeah. I love but, hearing um, this. One of the reasons why I, I asked about the, the milk is because when they do it in Japan like that, and uh, when my grandmother used to do it as well, she would really boil um, the stuff for quite some time, like put in salt, put in uh, sometimes a little sugar, uh, etc., and boil that, and then okay. let that, uh, you know, ferment at a very, uh, or not ferment, um, you know, uh, So creating, in a way, uh, she was pasteurizing the milk and then introducing it to the grains. Yes. Oh, it's interesting. Very interesting. Ken, I'd love it if you put your email in the chat, and I'd love to communicate further with you about all of this, please. Sure. So at, at this point, I want to go through how the breads are made. And because they're all very similar, they all use this three-step period, this three-step method. It, it's and, it, and it's interesting that in various parts of the world, I, I wonder, Ken, did you also learn the three-step method from your grandmother from Italy? Oh, great. Okay, so so you have these two starters, and initially they look quite different. The one that has potatoes or chickpeas or flour or boiling water, and and most of the times the recipe calls for a salt or baking soda or a spices, and 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 so oftentimes in the eftazimo, in the arcatena, in the Turkish nohutlu. Mayeli bread, it, it is a clear liquid in, that then gets fermented. And then you have the uh, recipes that use milk. In the States, we have these two different recipes that are quite different, but yield the same product. And again, in the States, it's cornmeal. But in Sudan, when they make gurgoosh, it's with lentils. And, and as Ken pointed out, maybe in Northern Italy, they, they poured this heated milk over it. Now the control is the heat. You have to have this consistent temperature for about eight to 12 hours to have your success. And uh, here are some uh, images. Here's a potato starter. Here's a pit chickpea starter. Here's what the foam looks like as it's beginning to rise up. Uh, here is an initial milk starter. And here is a starter of the gurgoosh bread. And here is the foam on the gurgoosh bread after about eight to 10 hours. Again, with that heat, consistent heat. So that's the first stage. And then the second stage Okay, so then the second stage, um, I've lost track of where, there I am, okay, is the called the sponge stage. Here, I, I wanted to show you, here is uh, what the foam begins to look like on the Arcatena, where uh, Marilena was talking about they, <clears throat> in Cyprus, they only use the foam. That's <clears throat> That's fascinating to hear about. Whereas here in the States, and I think with Eftazimo, they use the liquid as well as the foam. 
Here with the milk starter, it foams up. This is a very significant foam. And, and we would use, in the States, we would use the whole amount of this liquid. <clears throat> Next is your sponge stage. And uh, here you have uh, what the rise, if you want it to double. Here the sponge is rising up. Here is a potato starter. And here is what it will look like when it's done. And it gets very light and foamy. And here I want to show you, if you all can see, I'll stop sharing for a second. Here is the sponge. It's really rising nicely. And you, you can see there's some big bubbles forming in the bottom there. We've got a little bit, maybe about another 15 minutes and it's going to be ready. Okay, the third, oh, again, I just want to uh, stress, it always has to be kept warm. The sponge needs to be kept warm as well as the starter. And then we have our dough stage. And, and it's interesting, all of these uh, recipes are very similar. Here's the dough stage. You're basically adding flour, salt. Some add some sugar, some add lard, some add more spices. And then when you bake it off, these are the final results. Here's the salt rising bread. Here's some eftazimo. Here is some gurgoosh. And you can see they all have this fine crumb and a slightly flattened top compared to your sourdough, which is very different. I also like to point out um, that there's a wonderful sourdough library in Belgium that Carl Schmidt, he was on, he couldn't be here today. He is the curator at this sourdough library. He's got hundreds of sourdough starters and he conducts all kinds of experiments on them. One of his recent experiments is what is the microbial influence of the baker's hands? And they're finding that uh, different lactobacilli, different uh, uh, bacteria are introduced into the sourdough bread depending on the baker's hands. So we, there's a lot of interesting experiments going on at, at, through the Parata Sourdough Library in Belgium. Jenny, I have a question about the process. Uh huh. My husband generally cannot eat wheat flour, but yes. if I do a, a long proof, like an overnight proof, he can eat bread made from wheat flour. So I'm wondering with the bacterial um, starter, can I form the loaves and then put it in the refrigerator overnight or will they flatten out? Yeah, unfortunately the bacteria do not, uh, are not able to survive like they do in sourdough. Um, we have kept like a, a wad of dough in the refrigerator overnight, e even up to about three, four, five days, and then started a new starter from that to make salt rising bread. And, and Ken, I see your head shaking. Have you also tried that? Okay, but I don't know, Heijang, if the flour is digested enough. I, I just don't know the answer to that. I think not. I think there's some different chemical reactions going on. Yes, we have tried the, the uh, refrigerated uh, starter becomes more of a taste element as opposed to a leavening agent. And so you just have to recreate, uh, reintroduce the bacteria again so it will create the hydrogen that will make the bread rise but we found that it does impart a really interesting taste element if you use a refrigerated starter very much like if you were using a sourdough starter that you refrigerated um, because you had got it to a certain point where it tasted good um, because sometimes people will use a sourdough starter for taste and then actually add yeast uh, and you can do the same thing with an, an 
refrigerated um, salt bread starter as well. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you, Ken. Sure. Uh, so, so all of this, the sourdough library, as well as what Susan and I are doing, we're keeping this tradition alive so that this method of making bread without yeast is not forgotten. And um, uh, 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 those of you from California, have you ever heard of Vandy Camp's Bakery? They were kind of famous for their salt rising bread in the 1900s. Yeah, I had it often as a child. My grandmother would take me to... Ah a huge market across the street from Vanny Camps, and they were the outlet for the day old from uh, the returns on uh, Vandy Camps. And we ate salt rising bread quite often. Fabulous, wonderful, thank you. Uh, this is also one of the reasons that we opened up the bakery. There were a uh, Rising Creek Bakery in Mount Morris, Pennsylvania. Uh, because it's not possible to get salt rising bread anymore. So we uh, opened this bakery in 2010 and people came from hundreds of 50 miles away to get their salt rising bread. And we want to preserve these stories and the memories of people sitting around their kitchen table with family. And, and it's interesting how the smell of salt rising bread really triggers people's memories. Uh, in addition, we were able to get some grants to uh, teach some young people, apprentices, how to make the bread, to make salt rising bread more accessible and in more areas, and to preserve the cultural history of this bread. And then, of course, the book that Susan and I wrote, uh, which has lots of recipes and historical stories, some of the science, and uh, this book and Salt Rising Bread are still available at Rising Creek Bakery. This is the only written document in the United States about Salt Rising Bread. So uh, we are uh, glad to share uh, any knowledge that anybody else has about uh, any of the stories about Salt Rising Bread. So, so more research is needed for salt rising bread and I believe the Eftazimo bread from Greece, the Arcatena bread from Cyprus. As far as I know, there has not been a scientific analysis of the Arcatena bread in Cyprus. And uh, we would love to encourage people to uh, work with us to help bring this about. There, there's a lot to learn about these bacteria, the succession of them, how they affect human health and how they uh, enhance our nutrition. And even in terms of preserving traditional foods, I think there is funding available to research traditional foods and microbes across Europe and the States. So here's our last slide again. Uh, it has our contact information. And I think what I'm gonna continue doing now, we just have a few more minutes until this seminar is over and I'll make some bread. I'll show people what I do with the sponge to make the bread and please ask any more questions. Uh, Jenny? Yeah. I just want to make the comment that um, Jenny and I have worked together well because we sort of each take a little bit of a different um, side on, on what's important to us in the salt rising bread. And, and Jenny is leans more toward the scientific part and knows a lot about talking about the science and I'm sort of more on the side of the people. And so I just like to say that I hope that everyone can understand or will understand and I say this, that salt rising bread is really so much about not just eating the bread, but about the people who make the bread and how it has been passed down to people through generations and generations. And, and that of course, for me is what's most special about salt rising bread, plus it's a wonderful bread. And I also wanna say that Pearl taught Jenny and me this wonderful two things to always remember about making salt rising bread and one is you have to be patient 
and you cannot hurry it along. And uh, let's see what else. Um, yeah, just just patience is the most important thing with making salt rising bread. So if you try it, don't give up. You can do it. <laughs> As Susan says, it takes a while before you can recognize when the fermentation is at its peak. And it, it's an art, like any making any bread, it's an art. Yeah, Jeff, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Well, thank you again. That was so great. And it's very nice to see you, Susan. I love the book. I just, I just, it's such a great book and I really recommend it. Um, it's just really a sweet look at a bread. I mean, it's just so much love involved in this heritage history mm -hmm. and, and, and procedure. And it's just really, it's unique. Um, thank my, you. I, get, I asked you this question a, a while back, but now that I have Susan, I would love to know more about the process of that first written document from the 1770s that you uh, reference in your book, um, where, more about it, where it's at, what it said, if we have, a, if it's archived, if we have copies, um, just, uh, you know, as an historical document, can we, you know, is it available to look at and read? Um, you know, I know of the 1830s uh, Kentucky housewife example, but uh, one that's even earlier would be fascinating to, to see. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Do you know, Jenny? Is it yeah, the, is it the I, recipe? I, I, I think the recipe, <clears throat> the, the copy of the recipe that we got was in one of those church booklets, church, church right. cookbooks that stated that this recipe came from 1778 from their family. And um, I'm not sure that we have ever seen the original recipe ourselves okay we have we i have talked with uh the relative he was on uh our seminar that lewisburg put out uh, uh in uh, october is that when that was and he has the recipe so maybe it's something that uh, thank you for bringing that up jeff i should probably contact him and see if he can just make a copy and and sure. see if we can get that. that'd be fun to have it would great thank you all very much that was fantastic thank you okay let's see i'm gonna lower this down and uh as you can see this sponge is is, is getting to the top so i'm going to And, and if you can see how, can you see how bubbly it is in there? Okay, I'm gonna, it's very light and full of air holes. And this is what you want your sponge to look like. It's quite smelly too. <laughs> William, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, Jenny, uh, how, no would wonder. You know, okay, Jenny. How, how would you know if your sponge is not ready for baking or, or if it's past its prime, like it went too far? Yeah, um, it's, it, starts to, it starts to go down in the center and it will deflate. Okay. So, so there is a time element with the sponge as well. Okay, got it. Thank you. So Jenny, before, before you get in the demonstration, and um, I'd like everyone to take themselves off mute, and let's give a round of applause to this brilliant, brilliant talk by Jenny, um, and an also applause for Susan, for Susan's grandmother, and also for Pearl. Yes, that was hey, wonderful. Hey, hey, hey. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Now continue, and if you... Okay. We're still going on, but I wanted to be sure that we're yeah, all here. Thank you. Yeah, thank that was you. really good, Jenny. I just yeah. can't thank you enough. Brilliant talk. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, I'm heating up some water and I'm going to add a couple cups to this sponge. And I want the water to be hot. Okay, hot to touch.
While she's doing that, I have a couple comments. Always, always the didactic teacher on my side. Um, I wanted to call out that use of the aromatics, um, the, the cinnamon and ginger. Again, um, ideas that are not documented, um, brilliant ideas for us to use um, ourselves. Um, I wanted to re reinforce the need to research in, 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 in original languages. And lastly, for those of us from Europe, um, the northern part of Europe and North America, the richest countries, to, 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 to really keep in mind the need to, to focus on the whole world. Um, you know, don't, don't leave off Greek and, Greece and Cyprus. <laughs> don't leave off Sudan. Don't leave off, you know, Central Asia. You know, let's, let's all of us with this group, um, you know, look at the whole picture and, and, and get out of this, you know, myopia that, that our cultural tradition is so stuck in. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I think that's very important, William. Thank you. Uh, I've put about four teaspoons of salt in. I added one and a half cups of water. And um, I'm going to add, uh, we'll see. I don't measure. I'm not a measurer. But I'm going to add maybe uh, four cups of flour. Jenny, what, what's the temperature of your environment? Um, it's about uh, 75 degrees here. Okay. So what's that, about 22? Yeah. Celsius. I've got my oven on, so it's heating up the kitchen a little bit. And um, can you all kind of see this dough that I'm making? I've, I've added flour till it's... <clears throat> till it starts coming away from the sides. Here's a, a, a potato that got away. And uh, I, I like salt rising red to be a fairly wet dough. So I'm, I'm gonna dump it on the table. Jenny, have you used a harder flour for this or a stronger flour? Yeah, yeah, like a bread flour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. Um, I kind of like the all purpose. It gives it more of a cakey texture, which I kind of like. As opposed to sourdough, I like using the bread flour. Uh, one thing maybe, Jenny, that we should mention is that you can make uh, any number of loaves of bread out of one starter. Yeah. Um, generally, you know, for myself, I might make four loaves, but I've stretched one starter um, at home for about 14 at one time. I noticed uh, Pearl used to make, I think, 10 or 11. And then, of course, at the bakery, we had the gallon jugs, the <laughs> jars full, and we would make 40 loaves out of, of one starter there at the bakery. No, I, don't, don't you agree, Susan, that when you do that, the bread has a less strong, it, the smell is weaker? Yeah. I think so when you make 40 loaves, especially. But if you're just making it at home, I don't think the flavor is lessened by making 10 as opposed to four. Su Su Susan and, 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 and Jenny, could, could you respond to, to Ken's idea about adding yeast to it at the very end? Because, you know, there are French um, 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 references even back in the 18th century of sometimes adding yeast to the sourdough starter to give it a, a push at the end. How, how do you feel about that innovation? Um, well, I just tell you, Plain and simply, Jenny and I call that cheating. <laughs> we <laughs> never recommend it, and you should never do it. That was salt rising bread because it's not right and it's not true, and it's not the real way. So, uh, okay. we have heard of people who do that, especially um, 
bakeries are known very much for doing that because they can't risk having their bread fail and they do put commercial yeast in it but if you're going to make the real thing you do not ever add it well okay. another a big reason not to do that is because uh you'll get the flavor of commercial yeast instead right. of this wonderful cheesy flavor it does okay. mask the flavor right because it's delicate it's it's a delicate rise And Jenny and I can always tell, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> if I, I reach for that uh, yeast bottle, I'll keep you in my. One way of one way of just telling is you can see that when you add yeast to your salt rising bread, it doesn't have that flat top like like is typical <laughs> and like is should be there it'll it'll be risen a little bit on the top a little rounded so you all can can find out too if somebody's cheating <laughs> well that's the great thing about you know this concept of the dream of the best bread because of course the flat top is the sign of a failed loaf <laughs> and, uh, yeah. for you that's the sign of a great loaf <laughs> that's right <laughs> well it does also emphasize the point that uh, williams is making as well and it's so important in what he's writing about and what we're all doing is that if you can preserve the original intent in, in the original culture that it comes from, which is typically done, not in a written form, I think, but primarily in, in spoken form where one generation will pass on the technique to another. Uh, I think that's really important because what we're seeing all over the world now, and I was just speaking to some um, some farmers in Africa the other day who were uh, trying to fight against the uh, influx of uh, commercial fertilizer people who are, who are trying to force them to grow crops that are more profitable that they can do quicker using their um, fertilizers. And so basically what it does is it's pushing them from their, you know, hundreds and hundreds of year old traditions into something completely new. And so that's why I think that uh, it's always really important um, to mention the cultural aspect of uh, any history, uh, because that's, I think, equally as important as the fact that, unfortunately, um, we're, I mean, you see, you see it over and over again in the history of food, uh, where um, because of something, and this happened in the United States as well, because something is way more uh, profitable or uh, does not require as much labor uh, that, uh, you know, our entire food supply has become way more industrialized and commercialized and we're losing so much because of that. And this is an international phenomenon. So I think it's, it's very, very, very important for Susan, uh, for example, when she's recounting uh, the story of uh, salt rising bread to uh, not only verbally say that, but to include the fact that it's more important or as important to her to recount the fact that this tradition really depends a lot on what her association with a smell and her association with her relationship with her grandmother. I mean, there's always love involved in survival. And um, what we have to do is make sure that we don't let uh, financial concerns and uh, commercialization um, basically buy off that in what we're doing. So it's so, it's so important that we do include oral histories and, and how we felt uh, when we first learned from uh, a generation before us uh, about these techniques. And, and yeah, I would, I would definitely say that um, adding uh, yeast to a salt rising bread is definitely cheating in one sense, but uh, I would look at it also a, as something that, um, you know, it's like uh, in, in, in the 50s when people just started to take things that had been made a certain way uh, for hundreds of years and started to commercialize them. 
uh, and we lost so much like that. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure it's, as you said, so much easier uh, for a, a commercial bakery that has to provide a product, right? Uh, and they, they can't risk failure, but it does harken back to a question. What do you think when, uh, because obviously this is not an easy type of bread to make, uh, and every time you have to kind of like hope that it comes out well. What well, do you you're think dealing with wild bacteria. And, and that, that's the thing about commercial yeast. It's Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Mm -hmm. It's this incredibly genetically modified organism that always works. But here we're, we're just capturing what's on the grains and they vary. And, and that is partly why the flavor can be very strong sometimes and not so strong other times. And, and that's why the fermentation looks differently from time to time. What do you what think, think? What do you think 100 years ago or 200 years ago, uh, the, the bread mm -hmm. makers did if their starter failed? They you think wouldn't they have just bread. Faked it? You think they faked it anyway? Because that's kind of like a, a, a new thing where, um, where bakers are saying, all right, well, if you overproof something, for example, just bake it anyway. It'll taste. It'll taste okay. I'm oh, yeah. interested in thinking, what did they do? Like when they're starting. We, we've done that many times, and we've eaten those uh, door stoppers or whatever you want to call oh. them. And uh, uh, but it, but that's also why there are wonderful folk tales around the breads, and why uh, the some people say that you can't laugh too loudly or the moon oh, has to be right or uh, all and they're wonderful to to document those beliefs right, right. I, i'm sure that, that i'm sure that marilena has such a belief yes i want huh? to i want to add something uh, yes you know in the old days <clears throat> they used to do uh, arcadena up in the mountains uh, women up in the mountains at night, during the night, and if one was uh, one uh, um, a lady was going to was planning to do a cadena at night, she wouldn't tell the others, the neighbors, or anybody else in the village. They were afraid of the, the they were saying the evil eye, you know. So they would they would keep it a secret, do a cadena on on their own at night, and that's it. <laughs> Yeah. Marlena, were there any songs or other type of rituals related to the bread making? Uh, bread making in general or yeah. Arcadena? Yeah, for any bread, yeah. Were there any songs related? We were talking about that um, last week. Uh, for sure, there. I have. I, I cannot think now, just, uh, but for sure, um, there must be because uh, bread was was a staple. I mean, it was a it, it played a very important part in uh, traditional life. Um, I have to I have to make research. Well, I want to thank everybody for today's uh, seminar and for taking the time out. And if you have any questions, please don't uh, hesitate to contact me or Susan, and uh, we hope to hear from you. So thank you all again. I will leave the, the, the talk is officially over, but we will leave the room open um, for those of you who have further questions. And, uh, I, I and have to leave soon, but thank you for everything. I would just like to add something uh, in, especially, you know, my grandmother's uh, grandmother used to do it all the time. And my um, uh, father's sisters and in Ottoman uh, period uh, cookbooks, there is also a mention of ash water. Uh, so what you do is like a baking soda. Yeah. Uh, and you make all the wheaten products. Uh, wow. And my um, uh, aunts used to say that it is much uh, crumbly and crispier and uh, much more delicate uh, when wow. wheaten biscuits or any kind of wheaten products are made. Uh, with uh, ash water. It is uh, kulusu, kul is the ash, 
uh, and so water su is water so it's kullu su uh, is uh, in many um, old recipes i will uh, wow. look uh, for it and if i find but you know these days especially in february i'm so overloaded you know uh, i have four uh, book deadlines that oh, which i participate yeah. edit sure. or whatever Sure. and um, two newspaper articles and five radio recordings in a single week so Oops. it will take time sure but, sure uh, i know I mean. you're bugging me <laughs> and well it's very exciting to hear that this knowledge of using ash water or potash was also in another part of the world i i think that's very exciting and uh, this I is also present this is also yeah, present is really in, in oh also exist in uh, well uh, my my grandmother uh, well part of my family is from Salonika and part of my family is from Caucasia so but they uh, i mean it's also in recordings uh, so it yeah. must exist also in Greece in Syria probably because uh, i have just uh, checked uh, and in in southeast turkey they say uh, use only the foam part of uh, really? the uh, chickpea oh. starter okay. but then uh, when you ferment enough uh, there's almost no water left anyway <laughs> right, uh, right so yeah it's it's a shared heritage of this part of the world and uh, ash water was a uh, very very and then uh, when, when we had the baking powders and the baking soda appearing in the market nobody and nobody have uh, you know uh, have, have stoves in uh, in at homes anymore right. uh, so uh, nobody has uh, ash water anymore right but right. Um, there's even a saying maybe in uh, greek language is uh, the same um, a neighbor needs the ash of the neighbor so it is like you need the ash probably to start uh, to to use in baking fascinating oh and so I exciting the, the overall comment i mean what i think is you know we reach in these things through the limits of knowledge and and it comes down to historiography and and sort of because many traditions like this were not written down it's like i wrote the book, The Magic of Fire, when people were cooking on fireplaces, they didn't write down how to do it. And then more or less overnight, they stopped doing it. So if you've been using ash water and then suddenly you can buy baking soda in the store, you know, that's what you're gonna do. And um, also detergents, thing, ash water was used also for uh, laundry. Right, right. To make so soap. this could be like yeah. everywhere, you know. Yeah. So I think we have a tendency you, you want you want to work with facts and you want to work with texts, but you have to keep your mind open with this kind of culinary research because it may never have gotten into a book. So, or if so, you hear okay, they were doing this in Appalachia, or they're doing this in in Greece or or Cyprus. You can you, you can let your mind be open that they may be doing it in the Caucasus as well, or also in Ethiopia. So that's all I wanted to say. You just, and, and when you're writing, words, never say, this is a fact, unless you have data to back it up, but you can speculate and, and back up the speculation. Because I think that too much in bread research and culinary research in general, we've become so afraid of making ridiculous claims that, mm -hmm. um, that we probably miss some reality. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, William. Thank you. So I have to leave now. Thank you for okay, everything. Then, thanks, oh, and thanks for coming. Thanks for coming, sure. I mean. Jenny, you've been putting the bread into um, tin behind you. Do you yeah. leave it to prove? Actually, or, or I should, does I it should've... just go straight into the oven? Yeah. Oh no, no, you have to let it rise up. And I'm gonna put it in a warm oven. I have a feeling I missed it. I have a feeling I was talking too much and wasn't watching as closely. But I'm going to put it in the oven and um, we'll see what happens. I'm going to heat, heat it very slowly. It, my oven can be just warm. Um, 
and and then I'm going to turn it on debate. But I'm going to let this rise. It might take about an hour, hour and a half. So, so Susan, are, are you saying then that, that there's a really delicate moment? Susan, are you there? Yes. Uh huh. What What is your question? Well, so Jenny is essentially saying that you have to really hit it right. That that yes. part of the. Can you talk about that? Yes, um, she's speaking about when your sponge has risen, if you wait too long, it will deflate mm -hmm. really quickly. Um, and so I think she was saying that she was talking so much when her sponge was rising that she didn't realize that it started perhaps to deflate a little bit and lose its rising power. Right, Jenny? Yeah, yeah. Here's that other starter. Can you all see the bubbles? Yeah. bubbling up from yeah. the bottom it so it the, this starter is active i could make a sponge perhaps or use the foam <laughs> it's really tricky with salt rising bread because you think every step along the way is going to be okay but you can have a starter that works you can have a sponge that works then you can put your bread in the pan and it, and it might just not rise it's just very touchy and tricky and don't be surprised if you think everything looks fine along the way, but at the end, it doesn't rise in your pan. There's a reason for it, which you may not always be able to figure out, but it does happen. So it just takes patience, like we said before. And, and let me ask Ken, so you make a salt rising bread with chickpeas. Do you find that it fails much or is it finicky? Uh, well, Adler, I said last week when I make it, I usually will use a, uh, a, we have a big commercial dehydrator. And what we'll do is uh, set it to 105 degrees. So at all times, the temperature never goes below that. And if we maintain that temperature, okay, and, and allow the bacteria that we want there to thrive at the expense of all other competitors, we have yet to have a failure. Um, See, I, whereas, think there, I think there is something about the chickpea. I don't know. I it, It's a higher protein. Something about the chickpeas that the bacteria prefer. Yes, I, I, I would agree with you on that. And actually, um, one of the reasons why I posted the, the UNC uh, Rob Dunn's um, lab is that um, what, what they were finding uh, as far as... Um, the, the microbiota or the microbiome, I guess you'd say, of uh, uh, different bread cultures, sourdough or, or whatnot, um, was that uh, uh, basically terroir or where you were was extremely important, but also heat or temperature was very, very important as well. And one of the things I always remember uh, from making the, um, the chickpea uh, salt rising bread, if you, if you want, is that um, my grandmother would always do it in a very, very hot area of the kitchen. Um, and that I think is more that uh, if you look at some of the, the microbiology research that they've been doing on, on sourdough and what's in Asha and a sourdough starter, et cetera. Um, and you can see that um, if you do manipulate the uh, temperature that you can actually kill off yeasts while that's going on. Um, what temperature are you referring to right there? So like uh, at least 105 degrees. Oh, wow, okay. So, but yeast can be uh, basically pretty much wiped out at 85, 85 to 95 degrees. If you, know, if you really keep it consistent at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, for example, um, you can do, you can successfully make uh, a, um, a bacteria risen, a hydrogen from bacteria risen bread, uh, which is quite fascinating. Whereas um, some, if you were making a sourdough, uh, you would basically kill off most of the, the wild yeast at, at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. But at 105 degrees Fahrenheit, we know if just from studies on, um, you know, uh, either alkaline ferments or from uh, bacillus of toast based ferments that uh, if you get it all the way up to 105 degrees Fahrenheit, only really 
heat loving bacteria are going to survive. So you're not going to get any yeast, etc. And those heat loving bacteria create the most amazing flavors, which is why, you know, I mean, it, it is, yes, it's very delicate and at first it stinks. Um, but uh, when you bake the, when you kill off those bacteria from the baking process, it releases very specific esters that smell just so wonderful. Um, and actually, I, I was reading last night, Michael Pollan believes that that's actually a survival technique of the bacteria. Whereas these bacteria know uh, that they should associate themselves with a certain uh, population of hosts, or in our, our case, uh, human beings, uh, or any kind of environmental um, area where they're more likely to survive. So I think that it's really fascinating uh, that, um, you know, maybe the bacteria, you know, I don't know, <laughs> uh, but it does, uh, as far as I can tell, um, I think baking off the actual bacteria uh, not only kills it, but it also releases these amazing esters that I think would make human beings at least more inclined to actually keep making that. So. But it, you are definitely right about the very delicate, subtle taste of um, um, the the the, the C perfect names uh, uh, brands. Well, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Are there more questions? Well. Should we say goodbye? And I rush down and get my car and drive to Los yes. Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> Safe driving. Safe. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Susan. So nice to meet you. And, Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to meet you, William. <laughs> yeah. So you're both welcome back to speak um, on anything. Um, and again, Jenny, this was just such a, a brilliant talk. And I know everybody. Um, has appreciated it massively. So let's clap again. Thank you.